Okay, so I think I'll, I'll cut that part a bit shorter just to stay with the, to, to give the others a, a note of what you're doing here. Um, so Coop is the, the application protocol for constrained restaurant environments um, being standardized within the IETF. Um, talking about a RESTful protocol means that we are passing around documents that represent um, resources or states of resources to be um, precise. Those resources are in some form addressed by URL. So you have this naming scheme that you know from, from the World Wide Web that is now applicable to, um, to constrained environments too. Um, and there's this transport element to it that is uh, basically a request and response pattern. So you say, get me that resource, and it comes back with, say, an HTML document or some other representation of um, that resource. Or you say put something there or process this this chunk of data, and and that basically that happens. Um, so it's uh, co-op is, is quite similar to HTTP, but it's adapted to the use cases we have in the um, in, in low power and lossy networks. So um, I suppose many of you are working with networks like that, um, being mesh net, um, being other mesh networks, or being um, networks that um, that have very low data rates. So for example, this, this depicts a, a LoRa scenario where um, some people call those millibit networks. So the bit rates are, are reasonably measured in millibits per second, or maybe bits per second, but not integer values of those, um, or in, in, lossy, in, um, in, in mesh environments you might be faced with, with link loss. So those are the, um, the constraints we're talking about lost messages, low data rates, and in addition to that, um, devices with several hundred case of flash or even less. Um, and Co-op is a binary, um, co is a binary um, application protocol that addresses those, those issues but gives us similar semantics to, to HTTP. Um, so what did, uh, so what does, does Co-op look like in, in terms of stack? Oh, sorry, too fast. Um, so we have the, the application protocol um, in the middle that it was classically being specified in 2014, um, built on top of UDP, so it's completely connectionless. You can optionally use DTLS for encryption, like you use SSL or PLS uh, with HTTP. And below that, you'll have your typical IPv6, IPv4 network, a six load pan, uh, works just the same over Wi Fi or whatever. And in the other direction, um, the, the, resource, the representations we're transporting with that are typically expressed in, in either link format. I mean, of course, you can, you can have plain text, you can have HTML. You typically don't with constraint devices. Um, so the most common JASPL formats are link format, which actually predates even co-op, um, which is a way of expressing where the link goes from oh, and some attributes of um, where the link goes to and some attributes of that link target. Basically what you have in, well, think, think of an HTML file stripped down to only the links and the link text. And there is Cbor, um, which I wouldn't have want, wanted to talk about too much, but given that we are now coming from a presentation that was about uh, um, Embedded, um, embedded ready serialization formats. I'd like to use some words about that. Uh, CBOR is to JSON as co-op is to HTML. 
uh, to H sorry to HTTP. So CBOR is has the same data model. It's um, it's self-described. You can open any CBOR file and you'll know what it means. But it's targeted towards the embedded area. So you have um, compact messages. They are binary. Um, you can parse it with minimum overhead uh, with minimum requirements on on flash, depending on um, on, on, on what your targets are, of course. Um, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's relatively cheap to parse and it's, it's standardized and, and quite interoperable. Um, yeah, and on top of those data formats, then the applications of it. So some applications where specified um, are, are being specified in a more centralized way. So for example, discovery is something that comes with the co-op specification. This is an application that says, you, if you um, if you want to know where there are resources of a particular type near you, then you can multicast to a particular resource, get those results back, and, and then know what there is. So for example, where there is a say light switch. But of course, the, uh, the, uh, the majority of applications uh, will be casting or will um, be applica yeah, application dependent. And um, as we are on the right side here, um, I'm glad to say that as far as I can tell, everything that is depicted here, which is CoA as it was specified around 2014, is implemented in RAD. In RAD. So a big thanks to the developers of RAD. This is, uh, this is one of the reference platforms for this. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Um, now, um, this was 2014, and this is the reason why things are blue here, because um, things have grown. Um, I won't go into every detail here now, but use this more of an outline for the for the rest of the talk, um, because Coop has um, there's one particular application I'd like to talk about that's a resource directory. This is kind of an extension to the resource discovery I mentioned earlier, um, and it's also used by by other applications. Then again, so things can build on top of each other. And another big extension I'd like to talk about is OSPOR, which is uh, new um, security suite for co-op, which allows you to have end-to-end -end encryption and, um, and security without, um, without losing the ability to use proxies. Um, and at the end of the talk, I gave an overview of basically all the non-blue boxes that remain if there is time for that. Um, but before I get into the resource directory, there are two concepts I'd like to um, talk about a bit of, uh, in co-op. The first being being addresses and the necessity for the resource discovery. For um, the, the addresses in co-op are designed just like HTTP URI. So you have the scheme that's co-op colon slash slash part. Then you have a host name, which often is an IP address, and that is followed by the path. Um, and for the discovery of the path, what we do in the internet is usually, we, if we look for some kind of document, we just tag the name or something into the search engine of our choice and receive a link with, with, the, with the complete URL. I can follow that. Um, but when we are talking about machine-to-machine -machine communication, um, you, don't, you, you don't often have particular, you have the search terms, you have use different mechanisms. Um, but you kind of you, you do need to do some a discovery step to find out where that temperature, for example, can actually be read from. Because one vendor might store that under a slash temperature and the next under slash temp, and yet another vendor might use completely compact but um, non-obvious names for their resources. And the other part of the address is the host part, which also has unique challenges in the embedded area because when as long as we're talking World Wide Web. Things have their people buy a domain, they uh, redirect www dot to a particular IP address. That's usually a static address. Uh, things are fine, and especially in in, in mesh networks um, and with with IPv6, you have to face the um, the situations where you have address reenumerations. You might not know exactly in advance what your device's um, name will be. So, so that that addressing part is not that easy. So that that was about um, addresses in general, uh, the URIs in which they are encoded. 
And the other topic that is very important in co-op is proxying. So you probably know proxying from HTTP, where hardly nobody uses forward proxies anymore these days. And reverse proxying is primarily used for load balancing. But it, it, can, it can serve a few additional purposes. So um, taking this example scenario where we have a, a PC up on the uh, top left talking to one of the devices here in the middle, um, the, 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 the UDP message kind of traverse, yeah, traverses through the, the, the network and may get, for example, lost at any point of time um, on the path, in which case there will be a retransmission and and so on and so forth. There may be latency on the on the link that is higher than the PC expected. So the retransmission might, in fact, trigger a, a two, two requests at the same time because it's, yeah, never mind. Um, the point is, um, if you have proxy in between, so for example, if that router, in addition to being a, being a regular IP router, um, implementing proxy functionality, it could um, accept responsibility for that message, acknowledge it to the original sender, and then retransmit uh, then transmit it to the network. So it can take care of retransmissions. That's the first use of proxies we will be seeing here. Um, the second use of proxies is caching. So if there are several devices trying to access the same resource, if that's cacheable, that which is defined in code quite similarly to HTTP, so it can have a lifetime and for that time it's good. Um, then the, ca the caching proxy might serve that. Uh, what else do we have? Um, uh, protocol switching. Right now we, we are only talking about co over UDP, but you can map it to HTTP. Um, and we'll later talk about a bit, a bit about um, having co op over other protocols, for example, TCP. And if you're in that situation of switching protocols, then you have to terminate the connection in between. And that's a very important part. Of where it, when it comes to security, that if we terminate the connection in between, that usually terminates security. So that you have, for example, a UDP connection between from here to here to here to here, that um, in that on that connection, you a flow of messages. Uh, over that you have um, DTLS a layer, but that stops here, and the cat and the proxy opens the packet up, interprets it. But to use a proxy with DTLS, you'll have to trust that proxy. So um, those preparatory things being said, uh, the resource directory. Um, the discovery mechanisms that are around for, for co-op um, rely on either knowing the, the host and talking to that host, querying it for its properties or for its resources, or it relies on multicast. Now, we might not have multicast available in our network for various reasons. We might have it, but we don't want to use it because it's expensive. Um, there might not be any multicast at all. Um, or we want to take additional factors into consideration, for example, devices that just turn off their radio for extended periods of time. We still want to know whether they are around, and then can try to figure out how to talk to them. But we have to find them in the first place. And, and this is where the resource directory comes in which conceptually does something like a proxy to the discovery process, but for various reasons is not implemented in terms of a proxy because there's only so much you can do by storing and replaying messages. So what it actually is, is a piece of, of server software, which is talked to by devices that register in advance. So they are turned up on the network, they know or find the resource directory that's on that network. I connect there, announce their address, announce what they want how they want to be discoverable. Um, and then later on, the other devices can come along and look look up that information and be served the, all the details that are posted in there, provided they have permission to, to use them. Um, so in, just, just to have an example to come back, if, for example, those, um, those servers at the top here want to implement a resource directory, and what I mean, uh, you don't have to be a big server to implement a resource directory. If you're just serving a few uh, dozens of nodes, you can just as well be an embedded device that maybe has a few hundred K of RAM instead of a few dozen K of RAM. Um, but say this is, oh, sorry. This is the resource directory here. Then 
or those nodes, if they decide to register at a resource directory, will um, execute a step that's called finding the resource directory, which um, I hope the typical case will be is that the, um, the router, route announcements carry an additional field that announces a resource directory and that just carries the IP address of that, of that resource directory that we use in that network. So the device finds that address, sends a post there or sends the request there and um, is from that point in time registered there. And to have, um, yeah, to, um, in, to have an example of that, I'll take a step back and look at what a resource discovery looks like when we are talking about multicast so in the like in the, the 2014 uh, state of things. So in that case, you'd uh, you'd send a, a, a co-op get request to a particular multicast address, which in this case is the uh, don't quote me on that probably site local address of all co-op uh, nodes. Go to that particular well-known address which is um, the discovery point of the devices and ask about resources that have the particular type being a temperature. Where, where those terms come from is not being um, that defined at the resource discovery level, but this is, this is where additional standardization organizations come in, come in and bring in all their, all their ontologies. And they request that, um, that uh, discovered node then sends is hey I do have temperature resource and it ha you can access it with it with content type zero. Now, if that discoverable device is that decided to register the resource directory, it would look about like this. So it would send it would have found its resource directory in this case on on the example network and post quite the same data it would have made available for discovery. Um, to that address. And in, in addition, it's, um, it gives an identifier of itself, basically to, to have the resource directory find the same uh, node again, and a lifetime of that registration, in this case, five minutes. Uh, the resource directory acknowledges that, and the device comes back later on in regular intervals and makes sure that this registration stays alive. The client would then, or the, the client that is interested in looking up the uh, resource, we're still looking for temperature sensors, would then access the resource directory at a particular address, which is part of the, uh, the discovery step, and ask there for temperature and be served uh, the full addresses of all the devices. Now that, in, in the example before, I'll go back two slides. Um, we had a URL that just, or a URI references to be precise, because those details tend to matter in that context, that just says slash temp, because we're on one device, we already know where the message is coming from, no need to repeat the IP address. Um, when using a resource directory, you could get responses aggregated from several devices in a single packet. So obviously that, that needs to carry the information about that as well. Um, being being fully expanded here, but this is basically just URI expansion, and you'll just you'll that um, you'll then contact uh, this address for more for the concrete temperature. Um, as in, in the um, blog about the state of co-op in in Riot, um, um, I mentioned that base uh, the basic things are are there. I'm happy to say that Riot also has an implementation of resource directory endpoints, so it is already possible with a Riot device to set it up in just such a way that it will it will register itself and, and keep that registration active. I think some people are implementing that. Are there any questions in, um, before I go on to the topic of object security about the resource directory that I might answer right away? Uh, in which case I'd like to go on to object security. <coughs> um, name of the protocol that's, um, that is, be, is currently being specified, so it's, it has passed the, the working group last fall step and it's now being processed by all the other reviewers that have to have a look at this before it becomes an, an RFC for good, is called OSCORE. 
used to be called OSCOOP. So if you if you heard of OSCOOP, it's the same thing. It just got renamed. OSCOOP. It's Object Security for Core. Um, why are we using an addition? Why it wasn't um, that's a good question. I think it was because um, because it's actually applicable to HTTP just as well and not necessarily limited to Google. Yeah. Did I get that? Right? Yeah, I get this. Yeah, I I wasn't fully sure. So, but good point. Yeah. Um, so we talked about proxying before, and as long as the the security layer is on the transport layer. All that, all that, or is um, almost. I'm tempted to say pseudo transport layer things that we are doing here in Coop with with acknowledgments and also with um, with fragmentation uh, with message fragmentation, which is again coming from uh, from the requirements of those low power networks with their smaller message sizes. Those things stop working. Uh, across the proxy, because you either terminate the security connection, then you need to trust the proxy, or you um, or you don't have a proxy at all and need to consider all the link characteristics with respect to uh, retrans uh, same retransmission timeouts, round trip times, um, fragmentation block sizes, all that stuff across the whole layer. So, for example, if you, we are talking about a um, six little pan network here, with, um, Built on something that has a maximum message size of say 200-ish bytes, then Coop would fragment larger messages into SNPs that are about that have about 128 bytes of payload. And if we are going all the way through the internet with that, we are sending tiny, tiny UDP messages over a link that could efficiently handle much larger messages. Um, so it would be nice to have a possibility, have the possibility to do end-to-end -end security and still use proxies uh, and still use proxies for what they can do uh, for those for those constrained applications. Coop um, here builds um, Oscorp builds on top of Coop, but provides a, a Coop layer on its own. That it, that means. When, when we are sending a request and want to protect it, that request originally starts as a co-op request, but gets packed into another co-op request where some parts of the message are taken out, so those are the protected parts, put into a message, and that message is then sent as a co-op request. Uh, this has um, very nice properties with respect to the respect request response matching because we don't have to carry around much of the weight that we'd otherwise have to carry about how do those things match because we have an underlying layer that doesn't give us send a package here and there and get a package back, but we have a mechanism that already gives us a send a request and we get a response that matches that. Now we obviously, because there are untrust, untrusted proxies in between, we can't rely on that for in order to be sure that this is the message that we want. But we can use this request response mechanism to um, to keep around the, the the minimum state that we are having associated with that with that request, and and verify that the response is actually um, pertaining to that particular request, and also we have we don't have to send all the details in the response that we need to decrypt. Um, so when sending a response, um, we need to send along some details on how to decrypt that. If the response comes already on its underlying layer as a response to a particular message, we can use that as a context. Um, that's a nice talk. Um, I think it's easier with an example. So in this request, there's only um, so um, there are, there are only two parts that we actually want to hide because the other thing is more transport related and not privacy sensitive. So we want to hide the fact that this is a GET request. And we want to hide the, the actual resource that we are interacting with. So the information that we are talking to that particular node, that's obvious from the trend, from the traffic. And that's something we need to tell the intermediate nodes in any case, because there might be a reverse proxy, for example, in between, and that needs to know where that request is going. Um, 
So when that uh, that get request gets protected, uh, it ends up in a in a post request because we're hiding that it's a get. It could also have been a post or a put or what's or not. We're still keeping the some some of the details um, unprotected, but I'll come back later while this is okay. And all those parts that are that are encrypted, not including the payload if there were any, go into a um, uh, into a payload that's it, um, that's encrypted with an authenticated encryption with additional data uh, method. So that's basically a kind of standard cryptography primitive that we can use here. And the only overhead we are adding is at one point in the message we are saying that this is a, a, an encrypted message. We are giving a key ID, which in many applications can be zero length, and we are giving a nonce because we can't use the same we can't use the same key to encrypt the same encrypt different messages without having any indication of um, of that being a different message because of, yeah we won't get get into details. Um, another piece of overhead compared to the other encrypted message is that we are transporting the code again. This is because we need to have an outer code and we don't want to reveal what code we're actually working with. And then there are a few bytes of a tag which prevent um, adversaries from tampering with a message and us receiving a tampered message where the adversary might not know what exactly they changed but still have changed something. And with that tag, those are the bytes that provide us the, the authentication with the authentication. And in, in realistic scenarios, this AEAD tag is maybe eight bytes, and the overhead of, of the rest of it or the order of magnitude of three, maybe four bytes. So that's that's the amount of data we need to transfer additionally in order to have those security aspects. Um, before I go to the to the response, which is probably not that interesting um, about the token and the observe option. Uh, Oscor tries to um, to reduce the uh, tries to protect only things that are worth protecting. The token is an identifier that could change could be changed by any proxy, so there is no no point in protecting it. What is worth protecting is that this message that the response that comes back to the message is belongs to that original message, but that is <clears throat> um, the matching for that, so that the, the client application, um, when it receives a message, maps it to, to its original request, that is done by the token. Um, but if someone tamples with it and matches it to a wrong request, crypto just won't decode, the AEAD function will return a decryption failure, and someone will have messed with our connection. Yeah, they obviously were able to do that, but um, it will show up as a protection failure or a um, yeah, decryption failure, and, and it will be visible. Um, there's nothing more we could do about the, the token to protect it. And we don't actually need to. Uh, same about observation. I didn't mention that before. Um, compared to HTTP, co-op has the ability to um, to subscribe to a, to a resource. So you can get a web page, staying in the terminology of the web, you can get a web page and additionally say that, hey, and if that changes, please let me know. And that's what this observation um, indicator here says. And that is also <coughs> the, the responses, and that's probably the time to, to go to the next slide. Uh, the responses will contain a counter that is used for um, for sorting the responses. So if, uh, if two packages cross and the earlier package arrives later, um, that the client doesn't get confused and updates the state with a, with a low value. Um, there is no need to actually to actually protect that value because every proxy could change that value. As long as it's monotonous, it doesn't matter. What is checked in the end is that the sequence numbers that are used in the in the nonce here that those are chronologic. As long as they're chronologic, um, or as long as they're in sequence, nobody could have tampered with the message. Some people, an adversary could have swallowed the message. Yeah, they can obviously do that, um, but they can't make them appear in the wrong order. Okay. Um, then I'll just very briefly, uh, sorry for that. Um, Go through a few of the other things that are that have that have been added to the stack in the, the past time. 
Um, there are new layers below that could be used. Um, um, NFC in particular, I think, is interesting because this is where um, we're having a proxy in between might be nice when you're working with linked local addresses. Um, Co-op can now be um, also encapsulated in TCP with TLS or in WebSockets, which means that as long as you have a very simple proxy that manages the, um, the, the protocol switching between Co-op over UDP and Co-op over TCP or web, WebSockets, you can talk directly to a Co-op device from within your browser without having any additional browser API because the browser just needs to talk to some WebSocket component. Um, with respect to uh, content formats, uh, there is now SendML, which is a rather generic format for sensor, sensor and actuator data, where you can easily um, include time series of data and gather a bunch of responses into a message. For example, if you're querying a temperature humidity sensor, you might get a SendML pack that says my temperature is, my humidity is, in, in a single request. Uh, links have become much more efficient by being encoded in CBOR. Uh, core conf might be a topic that you might want to chat about with people who actually know something about it. But, um, core conf is, okay, if you can't short, it's SNMP done right. <laughs> <laughs> um, PubSub is a mechanism where you can decouple the content that you're sending from the origin your eye, so you're not sending, you're not using the actual devices addresses for the content anymore, but the, the participants agree on a topic, which then gets values published, maybe a bit like MQTT. If you're into that mindset, you might find something um, that is quite similar here. And core interfaces is a document that has been around for, for quite a while, basically it has been around in 2014 already. Um, that gives a few primitives for building <clears throat> building an actuator, building a sensor, and declaring that to the discovery interface so that you can actually see that, hey, this is something I might just observe or I might just put, put data on and see what happens uh, without going into the details of what precise kind of sensor this is, because this is what other standardization of organizations are doing better. There's live at time, there's open connectivity foundation. Um, I think I'm a bit stretching it for my work. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'll skip over that because I think we've talked enough about that. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, if you want more links on the topic, just um, go to the website. There is There are details and the QR code that goes for that link. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Yeah, we are very behind the uh, schedule, but there's the room for a question. Otherwise, we can take a uh, question and discussion to the, to the launch break after. I'll, I'll be around here today, tomorrow. Um, if someone wants to work on any of that, those topics, I have run into for most of them. No more questions? Okay. Yes, there is also co-op over SMS. Say again? There is also co-op over SMS. And yeah, I deliberately left that out because it's been around so long and I'm not sure whether anyone's actually still working on that. It's, it's, an, it's an odd case of some company having an implementation but not having a, an RFC for it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good to know. Yeah. And thank you for the email. Thank you. Thank you, Russell.